The lesson for the Old Testament this morning is found in Psalms 15, page 778 in the Pew Bibles. Listen for the word of God. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocents. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. The lesson from the New Testament for this morning is found in 2 Timothy 1, 13 through 18 on page 1695 in the Pew Bibles. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including by Julius and Hermogenius. May the Lord show mercy on the house of Amosiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's take a second to focus our hearts and our minds in prayer. Gracious God, though the world distracts us, still you call us things go wrong, our, our minds are easily taken off of focus of you, and we can struggle to, to get that focus back. But Lord, by your Holy Spirit, give us focus that we wouldn't other, otherwise have. Help us to hear your words, to be strengthened, to have our eyes opened, to have our hearts warmed and our entire being inclined towards you. During this time, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I don't know if you know it, but World War II was almost lost by a single person. A single person almost single-handedly lost World War II. Now you may be thinking, that's a bit of a stretch, I'm not so sure, uh, but a good student of history is going to know about the evacuation of Dunkirk. And if you know about the evacuation of Dunkirk, it's when the, the British and the French forces were evacuated from the main, main uh, continental Europe back into England. Uh, 335,000 troops evacuated from the mainland to see another day. The, the British government was only expecting 30,000 to make it. It was a miracle beyond all miracles, but it was almost lost by one person, 335,000 uh, uh, people. King Leopold was king of Belgium. He believed that a policy of neutrality 
would keep the peace at Belgium and keep the peace between Belgium and Germany. And so he pursued that policy of neutrality almost up until the final hour. Belgium was an ally of Great Britain, and uh, Churchill uh, actually comments in one of his speeches that at the last possible moment, Leopold contacted London and said, we need help. And even at that late moment, the British moved to help Belgium. British troops were, were sent to, to fortify Belgium. Uh, in part, uh, Belgium agreed to, to cover part of their, uh, of their border with Germany. Britain rounded down from there into France to try to slow the onslaught of the German panzers. And then, seeing the collapse of his country, seeing the, the overwhelming odds, seeing that, at least thinking, there wasn't anything to be done, and that maybe sticking up and, and fighting and, and, and perhaps losing everything in that moment, Leopold, without the advice of his ministers, without the approval uh, of their legislature, without anyone appointed an ambassador, a plenipotentiary, to go to German, Germany and switch sides and ask for peace. What this did is it opened up a 30-mile gap in the defenses against the retreating Allied troops, 335,000 of them, a 30-mile gap that they weren't anticipating. And so the British forces in that state, I imagine of utter shock, they divided their forces. They covered those 30 miles and they bought those 335,000 time to fight another day. All because one person, one man, just thought it was too much and wavered in the heat. It, it's a sobering thought. It's, it's a very sobering thought. But that's the type of thought that we come to. It, it's, it, this section of 2 Timothy is difficult. We're going to name some names. And as good Christians, we don't name names, do we? Except when things are going fine. Oh, I'd like to thank this person, and I'd like to thank that person. I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> I'd like to thank the foreign press. But when things go wrong... Well, it was a collective failure. I don't want to name names. That's when we name names, is when we say we don't want to. But here, Paul pulls no punches with Timothy about the peril, about the utmost importance, about the consequences and the stakes of his loyalty, not just to Paul, but to the gospel. This is, this is where we pick up in 2 Timothy. Paul says, What you heard from me, cape as a pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And what Paul is saying here is that when we are using our gifts, we are to be grounded by our faith. Paul earlier said, fan into flame the gift of God that is in you that, that was there when I laid my hands on you. But Paul wants to make it clear that as he does that, as Timothy does that, he needs to be grounding that in his faith. He needs to be grounding that in the gospel. Because it, there is danger when we stray from that. We are to be using our gifts, we are to be using our talents in service to the gospel. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them uh, to obey everything I have commanded you. 
Paul wants Timothy to use his faith, but it must be grounded in the gospel. That must be the source. That must be the aim. That must be the purpose of using his gifts. And similarly, we talk that we have been given gifts as well. So often the church gets distracted by the ministry of its pastors because ours can be some of the most visible. Well, I don't have a gift for ministry. That's what a pastor does. No, 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 no. We have been given gifts for ministry and they are to be grounded in the gospel because everywhere we go is a mission field. I was talking to someone recently who just came to that conclusion, who commented to me, I get it now. I'm the only one who can be where I am. Yes, that's right. I can preach at a, on a Sunday morning, but you are in that office nine to five, five days a week interacting with people that I will never see. There is your mission ground. There is your ministry field. And the gifts that you have been given for your job are the gifts that you have been given in service to the gospel to gain access, to build relationships, and to speak the words of life in that place. And it's, you would think, well, this must be someone who is just starting out in life. No, this was a mid-career professional who commented to me on this. I get it. God has placed me there. I have a job. Not, not one that earns income as we think of a job, but I have a job, a mission from God if we want to go to the Blues Brothers. How do we do this? How, how do we ground our work in our faith? We've, we've got to seek to bring those together, but, but Paul here highlights one aspect of it, that we must guard our faith so that it stays, stays grounded in the faith and love of Jesus Christ. This is an active process, not a passive one. What do I mean by that? I see it in churches where, wherever I've been, and, and, and pastors and, and elders and, and ministry professionals have struggled with this, that when we learn the faith, we say, okay, yes, I get it. Jesus died for my sins. I can recite, recite the creed. I can, uh, some of us can recite Psalm 100 uh, because that's what we were taught in Sunday school. And we equate knowing those things, having them stored in our heads with the active part of our faith or really with living out our faith. We say, I know this so I'm good. But nowhere in the mission of God, nowhere in the pages of scriptures do we ever see where God is content with just one person. Even Abraham who gets called out, I will make you a blessing so that you can bless others. Through the whole world, I will bless. I will bless you and as a result, the whole world will be blessed. God is never just interested in, in stopping and saying, yeah, that was good enough. We got some? I'll call that a good day. Guarding the faith is, a, is an active process whereby we, we see the world, we engage the world, and we hold that up to our faith and what we understand about the world because the, the, the faith is not just simply an eternal get out of hell free card. It is an entire lens through which we see the world and understand the world. When we hear phrases in, in our world, we hold them up to our faith and we say, does that square with what I know about the world? One of the, the, the common phrases that we hear nowadays, as I've mentioned is, in previous sermons, is this idea that you are created just, you are created perfectly. Don't change. You have just been created perfectly, and, and let's hold that up to our faith. 
that phrase might work well if we only had Genesis 1 and 2. But we have Genesis 3, and we know that we were wonderfully made, but we also know that we are terribly fallen. And we have to hold those things in tension. And when we engage and when we hear phrases, as we see things, we say, how does this square with the world as we know it to be? How does it square with our faith? We actively guard and engage. It's the difference between knowing Christ as Lord and living that out of that knowledge every single day. Knowing the Great Commission versus doing the Great Commission. How many of us could recite the Great Commission? How many of us say that we are actively doing that day in, day out? Or at least seeking to do it day in and day out. That's the act of guarding. And the, our guarding is going to be aided, as Paul says, by the Holy Spirit. And that's going to lead us to do some things. Uh, uh, John had the unenviable job of reading three names in this, in this passage. The third one, Anesiphorus, is held up as a positive example. Why? Because when he got to Rome, Paul was on trial. There was not a lot of goodwill for the Christians in Rome at that point. Uh, Nero was looking for a scapegoat for the great fire of Rome, and things were not looking positive. Yet despite those circumstances, Onesiphorus had, went, had gone around Rome saying, where is Paul? I must find Paul the Christian, the follower of Christ. And he searched, and he didn't give up until he found Paul. More than that, we see that this was a pattern in Onesiphorus' life because his, Paul's final, final comment about how much Onesiphorus had done in Ephesus as well. This wasn't a one-off. This wasn't a, a, a moment of bravery uh, where Onesiphorus got up all of his courage and said, I think I can do this one. This was a part of Onesiphorus' life. Day after day, he worked in Ephesus. He followed Paul to Rome. He was ready for this trouble. He was ready for the difficulty of faith. So why this next section? Why, why, why the section in between those two? Why do we have to deal with, with the disloyalty in between? Because Paul wants to be very, very clear about what happens when we do not guard our faith. For one, we may be pulled off our grounding in Christ. Uh, I said that earlier that we are to be using our gifts in service to the kingdom. We can still use our gifts but not have them in service to the kingdom, can't we? We can be a, a skilled teacher and never teach the faith. We can be skilled at, at uh, building relationships and never get to the point of talking about Christ and helping to, to, to build that faith in, in relationship. We can be fantastic at, 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 uh, at building things, at repairing homes, and never bring that under the lordship of Jesus Christ. We can be pulled off our grounding. The, the danger in my phase of life is that I can have children and never raise them in the faith. Biological children. Because at any given point, we have those gifts and we have those around us. We have children, we have grandchildren in the faith who have been given to us. We can be pulled off our grounding in Christ and still think that we're doing the right thing. I'll talk about that more in just a second. Uh, the other thing that can happen is we can desert the faith altogether. And, and you may be thinking, oh, you're going a little bit extreme here. I'm, I'm here. I am here at the right time on Sunday morning. Haven't deserted the faith. Well, uh, we want to take a look here for just a second in uh, Figilus and Hermogenes. 
and take a look at them. They are specifically named. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. These are ones that, that maybe were not supposed to desert, maybe were stronger in their faith, but when the time came, they were unable to follow through. They were unable to withstand the heat and got out of the kitchen. It seems harsh that Paul would name them, but we have to understand our reality. We have to name our reality, be willing to name our reality in order to deal with it. Ask anyone who's in AA. The, the first step to dealing with any issue is to admit that there is one to begin with. And so, Paul wants to admit that there is an issue when there is difficulty in our lives and when our faith is not nurtured and strengthened and developed into a fully mature faith. And even when it is, there is always the danger, and we have Phygelus and we have Hermogenes here as an example for that. Timothy, don't underestimate what difficulty will do. And so, intellectual desertion is kind of what they did. They, they, they just can't take the faith anymore. We, it's, it, compared to the difficulty of this world, I'm just going to leave it behind, and I'm going to stop this difficulty. But I want to talk very, very briefly about what I want to call emotional desertion of the faith. And, and it has to do with what we do functionally. It has to do with, with how we act versus what we say. Let me ask you, thinking about uh, Dunkirk at the beginning and, and World War II, uh, what good is a soldier that doesn't use their gun? Now, we've, uh, maybe some of us have seen a movie where one person was able to swing that. But an entire army... What... Well, what good is a, a, a pianist, a world-class pianist who only uses one finger? I, I dare say that, that if, if uh, I were to be a fully trained pastor and I only did one thing out of my entire job description, there might be some disgruntlement. That, that if Sheila used only one finger every Sunday to play the hymns, that there might be a little bit in the, in the annual review that we say, you know. <laughs> By the same contrast, what is a Christian who only attends to one aspect of their faith? Let me draw that comparison. And, and it's funny because we'll say, well, I'm here. As we read the whole counsel of God, when we look at the Great Commission, when we look at the passages in John where, where Jesus says, I'm sending you out into the world. As we see the, the trajectory of the people of God throughout the entire Bible being sent to be a blessing to others, to one another, to the faith, to call people back to God, to call all of creation into relationship with its Creator who desperately loves us and desperately wants us to be back into a relationship with Him. How much are we doing? And I'm not saying it's, a, it's an amount here. Don't hear that. We're not getting into works righteousness. We're not saying that we're not if we don't do it. But there should be what flows. It's interesting. I had wanted to read this a couple weeks ago, and I forgot. Screwtape Letters is a, is a uh, book by C.S. Lewis that screw tape is a senior demon and his, uh, his nephew, a junior demon, is writing for advice. Screw tape writes these letters to, to advise how we can be pulled off, uh, how humans can be pulled off their relationship with God. And I want to read just this one part of one letter. Um, Screwtape is writing to his nephew, and he says, Nothing is very strong. Nothing capitalized. 
strong enough to steal away man's best years, not in sweet sins, but in a dreary flickering of the mind over it knows not what and knows not why, in the gratification of curiosities so feeble that the man is only half aware of them, in drumming of fingers and kicking of heels and whistling tunes that he does not like, or in the long, dim labyrinth of reveries that have not even lust or ambition to give them a relish, but which, once chance association has started them, the creature is too weak and fuddled to shake off. Google had not been invented at this point, by the way. You will say that these are very small sins, and doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy, that is, God. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into nothing. Murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Your affectionate uncle, screw tape. Paul warns us, because the gentle, gradual road doesn't lead to a church that is overtly against the things of God. The gradual, gentle slope leads to believers into a church that quietly do nothing to advance the mission, and yet still believe that they are. It's a danger we have to be aware of. Otherwise, we are likely to fall into it. And the stories that we'll hear over stewardship will quietly and slowly cease. Be on your guard. Guard the deposit of faith that has been entrusted to you by those who came before you. Let's pray. Gracious God, you have given us teachers, you have given us mentors, and through them you have given us yourself. You have given us the faith which calls us into a renewed relationship with you that seeks to redeem the world. Help us as we go about our daily lives to be on guard, to guard what has been entrusted to us, and to pass it on as, we, as it has been passed on to us. Seal these words in our hearts so that we may live by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.